to do, um, I know you are missing my jokes. <laughs> hey, hey, I know Brian, you're missing my jokes, I know you're missing my jokes. I, I thought I'd share something funny this morning because uh, the word is quite deep. So let me share something that I thought was quite funny. A little Johnny is at school and he's in his maths class and his teacher says to him, Johnny, if I give you two cats plus another two cats, you got that? And I give you another two cats, how many cats will you have? Johnny looks at the teacher and says, I'll have seven cats. He says, no, no, listen Johnny, I say it to you again, I give you two cats. I give you another two cats. And another two cats. How many cats will you have? Johnny looks at his teacher and says, I'll have seven cats. He says, okay, Johnny, let's do it this way. I'll give you two apples. And another two apples. And another two apples. How many apples will you have? Johnny looks at the teacher and he says, I will have six apples. Really? Okay. So let's try this again. Johnny, if I give you two cats, and another two cats, and another two cats, how many cats are you going to have? He says, no, I'm going to have seven cats. But Johnny, I don't understand. What is this with the seven? You've got the apples right. How do you get seven? He said, no, because I've got a cat at home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what you call the shaggy dog story. That's a, that's a cat story. Yeah, what, what did you call the it? shaggy dog story. Yeah. Okay, so let's just pray and ask God's blessing on His word. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray that you would bless us through your word, that your word would speak into our hearts, and that you would open our minds to understand and our hearts to receive. And I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to preach from your word this morning this morning. So we give the part, this part of the service to you now and we ask that you would have your way with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to speak about greatness. Uh, the scripture reading from today is from Mark's Gospel chapter 10 verse 35 to 45 which deals with the request of the two brothers and I want to deal with this whole idea of greatness this morning. It's actually quite challenging when you look at it. Because if I had to ask you, why did you come to worship today? What's the reason why you came to worship today? What motivated you to get yourself organized, to get dressed this morning, get into your motor car, you know, get through the rain and all of that? And, and some of you travel far distances. I know some people come from the other side of the mountain, come all the way to worship this morning. Why did you do that? It takes some effort to participate in worship. That's the reality. It never happens by accident. It's a choice. You get up in the morning, you have to do a whole lot of stuff, and then you come worship. Why are you, some of you, those who are not visiting this morning, why are you an active member of this congregation? You may ask yourself why you're an active member of other congregations. But why are you an active member of the body of Christ? You see, these questions, they speak into our hearts this morning because we live in a time where many people flee from any kind of commitment, avoid community and refuse to volunteer for anything. They want to get involved. You see, the big trend is to, uh, is to be wrapped up in oneself and live in your home and stay in your home and not get involved in things that don't impact you too, too much and uh, it's the safest way to do that because in reality it's, it certainly does not enhance your social status by participating in church anymore. It doesn't make you something special just because you go to church every day, especially out there in the world. And yet there are people like you who regularly share in the gathered Christian community. You support the work of this congregation with your gifts and many of you work in many quiet ways to further Christ's mission and minister here at Gordons Bay United Church or here in this community. 
And I praise God for you. I thank God for you. Someone once made uh, or asked this question, and they asked the question, how do you, uh, you know, why do people go to church? Um, and if you knew why people would go to church, it would break your heart. Now I thought about that and I suppose that is, I understand what that person meant. Because there are a variety of reasons why people go to church and this can be a little bit challenging. Perhaps we go to church to gain favor from God. Perhaps to satisfy a spouse or to appease a parent. Perhaps to deepen a friendship. Some of you are here for the same reason, that you visit the shopping mall. You want to get something you need. For many, the church is a kind of a full service mini market, a place to pick up the spiritual resources you need in a quick and efficient manner. Others come to church for mood alteration, to get a sense of forgiveness, when they feel particularly inadequate or to seek comfort in the midst of grief and disappointment. Many come to church for encouragement when they feel depressed, confidence, when they feel afraid and inspiration, when their lives grow stale. Now our gospel lesson today focuses our attention on two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or as it is also translated, the sons of thunder, which means they may have been quite loud and boisterous. These disciples wanted positions of importance in the church. And the lesson that we heard read to us today is very revealing. First of all, it tells us something about the evangelist Mark who wrote that gospel. Because Matthew tells you this same story, but he has Salome, the mother of James and John, as the one who asks to give her sons positions of importance in the, in the coming of the kingdom. So Matthew blames or puts that question in the mouth of the mother. Because maybe Matthew may have the thought that it is unbecoming for the apostle to make such a bold request. Rather blame it on the mother. Mark, however, is more honest. He wants us to understand that the disciples were not just uh, paragons of virtue, but very ordinary people like you and me. And this lesson also gives us some valuable insight into James and John. They may have been lowly fishermen, but they were ambitious. These brothers wanted favored positions seated on Jesus' right and on his left when he came into his kingdom. In a way, they stand out for being boldly opportuni opportuni opportunistic. I'll say that again, opportunistic. But all the disciples were dreaming about a time when Jesus might win over his opponents. Clearly, they believed in Jesus and placed their confidence in his leadership. But the great value of the gospel is the manner in which it reveals what Jesus means when he speaks of greatness. A designation quite different from the way the world uses this word, greatness. For, for Jesus, greatness is defined by total, unconditional trust in God. You want to be great in the eyes of God? Trust him. What is more, Jesus tells James and John that greatness is measured in service, in spending our lives for the sake of others. How do we measure greatness? Our world tends to define greatness in terms of power, privilege and prestige. 
We measure the importance of a person, person by external markers, the house they own, the car they drive, the ostentatious nature of their lifestyle. We are impressed by the visible achievement of people, their prestigious honors and academic degrees, the importance of their profession, and sometimes even the accomplishments of their children. And we look at that and we say, that's great. But when Jesus speaks of greatness, he inevitably links it with service. As he said to James and John, that which makes us great is not our ability to rule over others, but rather our ability to invest ourselves for the welfare of others. In a world where most people want to put as little as is necessary into life and to get out as much as possible, our Lord speaks of a better way. Jesus calls to that better way today. Only when you and I are willing to put more into life than we take out, to put service to others in a place of honor, only then Jesus tells us, are we worthy to be called his followers? Now that's a challenge. I told you I had to take, tell you a joke at the beginning. It's a real challenge to us about who we are in our relationship with the Lord. There's a wonderful poem that I, I read by, it's called Mary's Son by Rudyard Kipling. Kipling speaks, and it speaks to this issue of greatness, which is at the heart of our gospel lesson. I don't know if any of you know it. And the poem goes like this. As I said, it's called Mary's Son. If you stop to find out what your wages will be, and how they will clothe and feed you, willing, my son, don't you go to the sea. For the sea will never need you. If you ask for the reason of every command, and argue with people about you, willing, my son, don't you go on the land, for the land will do better without you. If you stop to consider the work that you've done and to boast what your labor is worth, dear angels may come for you, will you, my son, and you'll never be wanted on earth, my dear. It's a profound poem because it says to Willie, her son, what is important in life. You see, I am convinced that the Church of Jesus Christ finds its authentication. And I come out of a church that has so many rituals and things and that the church does. And so much effort is put on many of these rituals. But I believe that its authentication is not in its public rituals, nor a solemn pronouncements on social issues, nor in the perfect quality of our theology and teaching. The Church of Jesus Christ establishes its credibility through its acts of mercy and kindness. The cup of water to the thirsty, the bag of groceries to the distraught, the life-giving supplement when we walk with someone who can go no further without help. That is greatness. That is what it's all about. There's a lovely story by Richard Karl Hoffler called Insights in October 1988. And I want to read it to you. It goes like this. Once upon a time in a far off country, a king had twin sons. One was strong and handsome. The other was intelligent and wise. As the ruler grew old, everyone speculated about which son the king would choose as his, as his successor. The strong son or the wise son? In this land, the sign of kingship was a royal ring. Just before the king died, he had a copy of the royal ring made and presented both rings to his twin sons. The chief advisor to the king asked him, 
How shall we know which son wears the authentic royal ring? You shall know, answered the king, because the chosen one will reveal his right to rule by his self-giving service to our people. It's a lovely story that. How will you know who is the right king? They're both wearing this ring. How will you know? It could be the one who is giving himself to the service, selflessly to his people. And that's really what it's all about. It's all about that. Giving ourselves for service for God and for the extension of his kingdom. The challenging word to all of us this morning. In Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and, and verse 43 and 44, it says, And Jesus said, Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. And so, this word today is a profound word for, word for all of us. To use of our gifts and of our talents for the extension of God's kingdom. To serve one another in whichever way we can. Now there are some things that we can do, there are some things we can't do. I know we have a, quite a few elderly folk in our congregation and we can't expect them to serve by running around and doing physical things, but there's a lot they can do. It's when they encourage one another, encourage the younger generation. When they pray for us. Some of you, and I'm not going to mention your names, I don't want to embarrass you, but some of you are very special who have the gift of encouragement just by the messages that you send to me in particular, just to encourage me in the ministry that I do. Knowing that you pray for me and just every now and again just telling me that you love me, which is just more than anybody could ask for. And it's not just about me, but it's about all of us so we can send each other messages of encouragement and serve one another and be there for one another and be a blessing to each other and to support one another. And I think one of the mark of the greatness of this community in this particular church, and I say this without, um, without hesitation, because it's one of the things that brought not only made me stay here and should have stay in this church and want to be a part of this community, uh, but it's just, it's just this ability that you have to love and care for one another. And so this word this morning is a word of encouragement to you just in case you've lapsed a little bit. And you just said, oh well, I'm just taking it easy. There's no such thing as taking it easy in the kingdom of God. You can turn to the person next and say he's talking to you. <laughs> it's true. You know, God needs us. He wants us to be his hands, his arms out there in the world, his heart, his eyes, his ears. He works through us. And he wants us to love and care for one another. You know, there are um, some congregations at the conclusion of their liturgy, when they end the service, they end it in a special way, which we don't actually do. But I actually love it. It's, it's profound. It goes like this. The minister would say to the people, the worship has ended. Now the service begins. Isn't that profound? Now the worship has ended. Now the service begins. Let that be our hope as we hear those words, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. The worship has ended, now the service begins. For if that is our intention, then we can truly say, and we can really mean it, thanks be to God. Amen. So let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your challenging word to us that reminds us that greatness is to serve one another, serving you through our service to each other and those in the community who are hurting. I thank you for those who give of their time to feed the hungry, 
Those folk who are part of the charity shop will give them their time to work there so that we can support the community. We thank you for so many of our people who pray, who encourage, who get involved in things quietly behind the scenes that no one even knows, knows what they're doing, but you know, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us, and we thank you for your amazing grace and for your amazing goodness. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory because, Lord, you give us the strength and you give us the ability to do your work and to be there for each other. This morning, Lord, we want to lift our sister and to you. We pray that you would bless her as she mourns the passing of her husband, Alan. We pray that you would comfort her and that you would strengthen her. And we pray, Lord, that... Uh, you would just fill it with your peace. We thank you, Lord, that Alan loved you and knew you and that he's with you. So we look forward to celebrating and giving thanks to God, giving thanks to you, Lord, for Alan's life. And so, Father, we pray now that as we slowly draw to a close in our service today, that you would just send us out in the world to be a blessing to others. Give us someone to bless in this week, someone to care for, someone just to encourage. And so, Father, we ask all these things, and we thank you for your love for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.